Hello and welcome to The Hearing, I'm John. And from Chicago's north side, I'm Scotto. And without any further ado, on to this week's album, which is Business as Usual by Men at Work. Men at Work are an Australian rock band best known for their song Down Under. Vocalist and guitarist Colin Hay and guitarist Ron Schreckert had previously worked together as an acoustic duo. Uh, the pair were joined by drummer J- Jerry Spicer in 78-79, and at which time Schreckert switched to bass. The pair were then joined by um, soon after by bassist John Reese and multi-instrumentalist Greg Hamm, causing Stryker to switch back to guitar. And <laughs> this cemented the band's best-known lineup uh, that lasted through two very successful albums, Business as Usual and Cargo. In 1984, Spicer and Reese were fired just before the recording of their third album. Um, and then Stryker left during the recessions for that album, and Hamm left shortly after its release. Wow. Leaving Colin Hay the only original remaining member. Um, uh, Hay and Ham then reunited in 96 and toured his men at work until 2002. Ham passed away in 2012. And in 2019, Colin Hay revived the men at work name and began touring with a backing band. Mm. Um, interesting rise and fall there. I'm surprised they never got a behind the music. Yeah, I have, I don't think I've ever heard the third album. In fact, I, I don't remember I, I distinctly i own it i owned it on on compact disc i distinctly remember buying it i i was shocked to even see it existed honestly when i went on sp- their spotify page and saw like wait there's a third one well, that must be like something recent they're like wait from 85 no. yeah too hard it's great <laughs> great well it's another case like uh, missing persons though not as extreme because the first album is brilliant the second album was still really good, not as strong. The third album, not nearly as good, though better than Missing Persons' third album. Um, it's it, um, Two Hearts has some really good songs. I, don't, I love the title track, uh, another one called Still Life. Um, but the one we're talking about is Business as Usual. It's the band's debut album. It was released on November 9th, 81, except in the U.S., where it wasn't released until June 82, on Columbia Records, produced by Peter McKeon, and features the aforementioned lineup of Colin Hay on lead vocals uh, and guitar, uh, except lead vocals except for track five. Greg Ham on flute, keyboard, saxophone, background vocals, and lead vocals on track five. Um, Ron Stryker on guitar and background vocals. John Reese on bass and background vocals. And Jerry Spicer on drums and background vocals. Reminder, I don't edit any songs into our episodes for copyright reasons, but down in the description, if you're listening to this on YouTube or on our blog at johnandscotto.com, you'll find links to Business as Usual on Spotify and YouTube, so you can listen along if you'd like. On to track one, Who Can It Be Now? Men at Work was my first favorite band. Back really? Back when I was a tween, and, and there's, I, I'm still a fan. Um, Love the opening drum fill. Love that it's a pop song about paranoia and agoraphobia. <laughs> Colin Hay uh, wrote about before, some really interesting stuff. This is before the saxophone was a cliche, really, yeah. I think. This was, um, it's debatable whether it was them or, or Hall and Oates, you know, because Hall and Oates brought in, like, did the sax heavy stuff in the early 80s, too. So it's mm. kind of, a, a, they're in the running. They're kind of tied for that. Um, but yeah, it's about a guy who doesn't want to leave his house and doesn't want anybody to visit him. I mean, you had guys like Lou Reed in the seventies. Um, oh yeah. I mean, but they were they were con- kind of outliers. They, well, they that's were the thing is, in other genres, it was not an unusual subject matter. But right. in a Pink pop Floyd. song, yeah. <laughs> this is very much a three twenty pop song. It was a big oh, yeah. hit, but it's about paranoia and agoraphobia. Um, I loved it's Striker. Such an hmm? unusual choice for a lead single, too. You yeah. know. And both of the singles. We'll get to the other one, you know, third, but um their most their best known song is much more interesting than people realize. Um Yeah, of course. But love Ron Stryker's heavily chorus tone and the kind of eerie harmonies and the guitar and the bridge. The bridge gets dark, you know. <laughs> is it the man come to take me away? Why do they follow me? It's not the future <laughs> that I can see, it's just my fantasy. I, I just I, I I've talked about how, you know, um, Night Court and the Gong Show are are responsible for my twisted perspective on things. (laughs) Colin Hay is a big part of that as well. (laughs) Um, 
love the phrasing in the sax solo. Um, oh, most of this band, as musicians, I think because they were a very successful pop band for a while, don't don't get the credit that they deserve as musicians. But that's odd because I mean their fame was really brief if you think about it. Very I brief, mean... but they were also ridiculously big. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I don't know if if people younger than us could understand just how big this album was back in 82. From 82 to 84, they were the fucking Beatles. I don't know if I'd take it up to 84, but um, but like 82, uh, yeah, first yeah, two 83. Um, they like, were fucking huge for those first two albums. Like, there was an episode of Different Strokes, I remember, where Willis was listening to this album <laughs> in his room. Yeah. They, like, went to Willis's room, and they, they, like, only played, like, a snippet, like, long enough that they could on TV without right. having to pay for it. But you could definitely tell it was underground. Yeah. Oh, nice. They picked, they didn't pick a single. I'm, I'm impressed. No, no, they did not. Although, actually, I think Underground was a single. It was, like, the last one. Oh, okay. It wasn't one of the big ones, though. Right. Um, Because I don't think there was a video for it. I'll have to look. Um, No, I don't think so. But it's just this really interesting way to open the album. I feel weird saying that because the song did get a lot of airplay. It was a bit overplayed. Oh, yeah, totally. Very much so. such an interesting song if you kind of forget about all of that. Um, On to track two. I can see it in your eyes. Love the reverb-laden keyboard that just starts this. Yeah. It's this three-note keyboard riff that is just so memorable. Um, greatly guitar tone, great groove. Colin Hay is a great actor vocalist. Oh, of course. I, I mean, and they're, they're technical yeah. vocalists, too, I think. Yeah. He's just got an unusual tone. Yeah. Because he has a very heavy Scottish accent. He's from Scotland. The rest of the band is Australian. Um, yeah, I don't think I realized he was Scottish. Yeah, he's originally from Scotland. Um, it, it shows up in his vocals. Um, yeah, so he's got the heavy accent and just kind of an odd tone. But yeah, he's a great singer. Um, I If you told nine-year-old me that he was going to play in a bar like right across the street from my house and I wasn't going to be able to go, <laughs> yeah. uh, oh, I would thought you were crazy. Yeah. <laughs> But just, you know, scheduling, it just didn't yeah, work out course. for me, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, I, I've I gotta pay more attention to his solo stuff. Um, I gotta get into that. Um I, I saw a video of a acoustic version of Overkill that he did at Norman's Rare Guitars, my favorite Men at Work song. Up until Marion Calls Vespers, it was my favorite song. Um oh, wow. just brilliant. Um but back to I can see it in your eyes. I love the groove, great guitar solo. Um, I would love to know who played it because apparently Colin played a lot of the guitar solos. Really? Even on oh, the Overkill solo was Colin. Um, it it so, is very vague about like who plays what guitar on what. Yeah, you know. I was. I always assumed Stryker played all the lead, but then I found out Colin played the solo on Overkill, and yeah. I'm starting to think that they they really kind of traded off a lot because Colin's a hell of a guitar player. Yeah. Um, love the drums during the solo. Um, love John Reese is playing. He's very subtle, but he supports the song perfectly. I uh, love how the bass just follows the keyboard riff in the outro. It's very similar to like a, a Billy Joel song, this one, which I, I mean, it kind of shows their mm. versatility, really. It's like a synth heavier Billy Joel, really. Yeah, I can see a similarity there. Um, oh, and... yeah, especially if you're thinking about, you know, Billy Joel, late 70s, early 80s. Yeah, yeah. And this is one of the songs of theirs that's in heavy rotation for me. And I'm not a huge Billy Joel fan, if I'm honest. So that kind of is an interesting thing to admit. Uh, you know, he has his moments. He has his moments. In, I love a few day. of the songs. Definitely. Um, on to track I, three, I, Down Under. And until the... listening to that, honestly, I don't think I had ever thought of my old college rooms or my locker. Yeah. <laughs> um, on to track three, Down Under, their calling card. I, have they just gone and made this literally the national anthem yet for Australia? Interesting thing is if you pay attention to the lyrics, it's about the over-commercialization and exploitation of Australia. <laughs> of course. It is of what course. the rest of the early 80s was going to be before it even happened. This was before Crocodile Dundee, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yes. Definitely. That was like a year or two later. Um, at least. At least. 
So if you really pay attention to these lyrics, it's not what people think it is. People think it is what the song is complaining about. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the, the problem when you write an anthem like this, though, because that's really what they went and did. Yeah. I mean, it's not how you write, you know, a something song. lampooning something or protesting. Yeah. They, they basically sounds like, wrote, I love L.A. <laughs> but it's written as parody. I love LA was written as parody too. Oh, true, true. Um, and, <laughs> and they play it before like all this LA sports yeah. events and stuff. <laughs> Their anthem. Yeah. Um, and it's this ridiculously huge hit that has been insanely overplayed with two very obvious drug references in the lyric. Yes. Right. Yeah. Um, the first verse traveling in a fried out combi on a hippie trail head full of zombie. Zombies, a type of weed. Yeah. And in the last verse, lying in a den in Bombay with a slack jaw and not much to say. An opium den. Yeah. In this ridiculously popular song, the 80s were a very different time. Yeah. And that opening percussion riff, I think in the video it's played on bottles. It actually does sound like he played it on bottles. Right. It's just That's... iconic. Just think of everything they combined here. I mean, mm -hmm. it's reggae. There's some funk in there. There's a yeah. little rock in there. There's still some jazz in there. I just love the interplay of the guitars. Um, the the just the chaos in the instrumental break, um, and just the high harmony that comes in at the end of the chorus. It's this amazing song that was just criminally overplayed. I I honestly have really i have to take the coward's way out again unfortunately this is and, your favorite pick, i have to pick this as strongest because it's just, just it's just ridiculous it's a good pick. um and by and... the way i listened to kookaburra sits in the old gum tree and that lawsuit was horseshit get out of there's my brain i was just gonna talk about that um <laughs> there's like three notes maybe in there that kind of lineup but to to think that they could actually sue and win that case fuck that there, there are just things, to... songs of this album that borrow from other artists much more closely than that. <laughs> and I wouldn't sue for them either. Just to fill things in, the flute riff, the iconic flute riff from this song, quotes the Australian children's song Kookaburra, which led to the band being sued for copyright for infringement in 2009 after an Australian talk show raised the question of, you know, does this pop song, you know, sound like Kookaburra? 28 years after the song was released. Yeah, it's just utter horseshit. Mm. It, it, it hardly even sounds like it. I have to listen to Kookaburra. I've actually never heard it. Um, it, There's like three notes that are kind of similarly used, but it's a real stretch to say mm. that this is something you could sue over. And even if it was dead on, I get the choice. Because they are talking about the you know the exploitation of Australia, putting a snippet of this you know children's well known apparently in Australia children's song in there makes sense. You yeah. know, the Australians will get the point. Like, I mean, Be Good Johnny takes a lot more from Peter Gabriel's On the Air, okay, than this took from Cuckoo Birds. It's <laughs> the old gum tree. <laughs> And I still wouldn't sue, you know, if I were Peter Gabriel, I don't yeah. think he would have a case to sue right. for that either. Uh, I think my only criticism on this album is on this song, though. The ending choruses just go on a bit too long. It's only three and a half minutes still, or 3.45. But you get like halfway through the song and it's just chorus out. Well, because it's, it's that chant. It's that, it, I mean, come on. Hmm. Um, on to track four, Underground. Love how I high the bass is laid down under live. It's like eight minutes, probably. <laughs> yeah, yeah, true. Um, <laughs> underground. Love how high the bass is in the mix. And another case where we have dark lyrics on a poppy song. And I love that about this. It's about war. Yeah. Um, there's no of oh, the one line that got me though in 2020. There's no need to you for you to fight, boys. Hang up all your guns. Find your mask and as best as you can get ready to run. <laughs> It's just this really simple song, but I absolutely love it. I love the guitar riff at the end of the verses, how sparse and huge it gets in the in the, the bridge. Um, nice guitar effects when verse one is restated. Um, 
love how the fir- the opening lines kind of come back but are changed slightly. In the beginning, it's, don't take the fire from your eyes, let's make them feel the, the heat. They build, they build castles underground for the rich political elite. It comes back, it's, uh, don't take the fire from your eyes, let's make them feel the heat. But my head's unsteady, I can't seem to keep my feet. And, I mean, this was oh, has always been a favorite, even back mm-hmm. nine-year-old, you know. <laughs> um, and I obviously could not have understood the lyrics back then no, no. but i don't know is his optimism sarcastic or is it uh that's always the question genuine? with colin well right because he that... always there was always this note of sar- sarcasm and kind of a, a an evil grin in his lyrics but yet if you look at it at face value there there's an optimism here mm-hmm but is it a sarcastic optimism? Yeah, we'll be all right in the morning. There's always and and I I I I don't like saying this specifically because Colin does have a lazy eye, but there's always an eye roll in his lyric. <laughs> um, you know, there's always that I, talking out two sides of his mouth, um, which I which I love. Again, this is he's one of the reasons I'm as twisted as I am. Um, <laughs> love the drum fell after the Eiffel Tower line. Um, oh, yeah. And I always wondered at the very end if he was singing something at the end along with the sax part or if he was just singing along with the sax. Like, if there are lyrics there or not. I couldn't find anything. I couldn't make it out. Yeah, I've never understood it. I think he might just be singing along with the sax part. Yeah. Um, On to track five. Help us automa- automaton, I'll say, because that's how they say it in the song. I don't know if that's the pronunciation in Australia. Automaton is how it's pronounced here. Yeah. Um, I love this one. Uh, this is Greg Ham vocal. Greg Ham's vocal. I, 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 it's just wonderfully goofy. I, honestly, I'd probably pick this one as a favorite if I didn't have doubt yeah. under on it. <laughs> oh. um, it's, and it's about a robot that falls in love. Um, yeah. It's the only proper new wave song on the album. Yes. Yes, very much so. Because you, you had said we were doing two New Wave albums last week. This one is really more pop rock than New yeah. Wave, except for this song. Um, I just I love the electronically doubled vocals and this insistent bass that's just way ahead of the beat. Um, I think it's the first time I'd ever heard a vocal distortion before. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> um, I, I didn't know if it was done elect- you know, when I was a kid. I didn't know it was being done electronically. I just thought it was somebody with a really low voice doubling it. <laughs> Right, exactly. I think uh, when I was little, I don't think I, I, this one took me longer to get into this one. It was kind uh-huh. of, you know, weird and, and new wave. And of right. course, when I got older, this one is what I'd come back yeah, for. Yeah. Um, and surprisingly, given the subject matter, not many keyboards. It's He's kind of subtle with the keyboards. Well, because he's singing. So, mm-hmm. I mean, sometimes it's harder to play and sing at the same time. Maybe. Um, but, um, I just love the guitar fills and the weird distortion on the line, distrusted, not rusted. Like, they crank up the distortion <laughs> effect on that one. Yeah. Um, and they kind of question, is he a robot? You know, you know, it, it, is, is it just, is it actually a robot or is it a, a delusional kid? Yeah, that that is always what's interesting about it. <laughs> Um, loved the guitar break, and I'll call it a break. It's not quite a solo, um, right? And the insistent, ha- the hi hats get really nice and insistent during that, and it just ends on this riff that just gets really intense when the keyboards come in. Like, <laughs> you know, Ham for being the one who wrote the song is really judicious with how he uses his instrument. <laughs> um, on to track six. People just love to play with words. This is my pick for weakest. Same here. Yeah, uh, it's a good song. It just doesn't really fit on the album. They they kind of did the least with it here. I mean, they have a nice sing along, but mm-hmm. I mean, they already had a better one with Down Under right. before this. So why come back yeah. to double down on it? Right. Um, I do like the lyrics. They're they're, they're clever. Um, nice groove in the chorus. Um, nice high synth on the chorus too. Um, never noticed. Actually, never noticed that before. There's a synth line in the chorus, really high. It's just the first time it's I've caught it. But I don't go back and listen to this one very often. So yeah. Um, nice subtle walking from Reese. Um, n- nice rhythmic change during the sax solo. Some nice dissonant low sax on the chorus is out. Um, but overall, it's just eh, 
it should have been yeah. left. This is there were a few songs they recorded during this session. There were two songs specifically, F nineteen an instrumental and one called Crazy, that didn't make the album, but this one did, and I think both of them are better. You know, I, I, I an instrumental probably would have been awesome on this. Yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Why did they do that? On to track seven, Be Good Johnny. I hated this song as a kid. <laughs> I can't imagine why. Because I was always teased with it. And aside from a few older relatives, I hate being called Johnny. <laughs> but the song has absolutely grown on me over the years. Um, loved all of the guitar in the intro. Um, and just this jagged rhythm in the verse. Uh, especially... I, this song's always weirded me out, you know? the It's an odd song. What uh, what kind of boy are you? <laughs> you know, yeah, like... <laughs> there's kind of an implication in that line that I, I, I enjoy. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, love Collins acting in the verse, because this is the where he acts the most. He practically speaks. He really does speak the verses. He right, doesn't sing right. them. Um, and that, yeah, that riff, is, like I said, is uh, on the air for Peter Gabriel. Okay. Gabriel's. I got to take a song out then. Um <laughs> Great drum fill leading to the pre-chorus. Love, again, it gets really sparse and huge in the chorus. Um, love the how the intro kind of comes back for the intro, uh, for the instrumental break and the outro. And Jerry Spicer, I, I think being in this band cursed him. <laughs> First off, I'm glad he's still playing. He, he also works as a, a corporate consultant. He was a motivational speaker for a while, but he I still am. plays in a number of bands. Um, he really deserves to be on every greatest drummers of all time list. He's just an incredible player. Um, and he really got shortchanged, I think, because he was in a very popular pop band. Well, I mean, sometimes that buys you a way in, but yeah, I, I guess, hmm. You don't get, if you're too successful, particularly if you're playing pop, you're not taken seriously as a musician. And I think that happened with almost everybody here. They're brilliant players, but they weren't taken seriously because they were so super successful with very commercial music. One could say they the band was cursed when they had the you know the well, the whole best new artist. Yeah, best uh, new the the the, <laughs> uh, the cur- what do they call it? Um, the kiss of death. The, yeah, the award of death. <laughs> they got best new artist at the Grammys, and but nobody think... who's gotten that has has done well afterwards. I think, you know, putting this as a third single, single was just a disastrous idea. Because, <laughs> I mean... It's just weird. I, and I love that for, about it, but... I mean, you pick Underground instead, and I think, yeah, I think you'd have a better run. Mm-hmm. There's also this this amazing tonal shift at the end. Um, but I, I just... I This album, reviewing this album this week, even though I listened to a fair amount of it regularly, was just a revelation about Jerry Spicer. Because I think he... Now that I've, you know, Swish Percussion has been a huge influence on me, I'm just realizing how much I play like him or try to play wow. like him. Um, he's just has got such great phrasing and this great big tone. Um, on to track eight, Touching the Untouchables. This was almost my pick for favorite. This was a close second. Um, love the intro guitar solo and the drum parts and this kind of off kilter riff leading into the verses it's like it's a doubled guitar part that's just slightly out of sync i mean it it goes in so many different directions here like the intro Mm -hmm. and the the regular song almost really don't go together but they somehow do (laughs) and again really dark lyrics i've never really been sure what it's about either an undercover cop or maybe a homeless person or no i you know this song and the next one are two that I really did not remember because I guess I just was all about the first side mm-hmm. as a kid. Right. They're um, not the songs that would grab you as a kid. But Untouchables is something from Indian culture. Oh, uh, the a, the, the a very caste. yes, the lower caste, a very undesirable, mm-hmm. and you were you're not allowed to touch them even. Uh-huh. So that I think that's what the the title, being the Untouchables looking at, at how the downtrodden are living. Okay, that makes sense. So he is kind of a bit of a homeless person. That, that's yes. closer. Um, love the sax and guitar riff after the verse. They play together. Um, I love that. Yeah. 
So, and, like, hearing this, I mean, it was almost like hearing it for the first time yeah. because I could not remember these songs from, from 20, 30 years ago. This is, again, another one I listen to in heavy rotation. This has always been a favorite of mine from the album. Love the low harmony on the line, tell my secretary I ain't taking any calls. And then the <laughs> next line reminds me of OCC. If you want to find what? me, just ask the boys down at the wall. <laughs> While we were at OCC, I always kind of, on, you know, days when the weather was appropriate, set up camp at, at at the end of this wall outside of the student center. I pretty much yeah. lived there when I was on campus. Yeah, and it was just this coming and goings of uh, uh, different people that, that just, uh, yeah. had time to kill between classes. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I love the eerie instrumental break with this ah, uh, instrumental in quotes, because there is a vocal, but it's just this ah uh, vocal. Yeah. Um, really interesting kind of eerie melody um, with this really pronounced ride bell. Love that. Um, and some great drum fills at the end. Um, it's just, I think it's the most interesting song, or one of the most, second most interesting song, I'll say that. Yeah. Uh, on to track nine, Catch a Star. Love the groove. They're often called a reggae rock band. But this, yeah, this is, is the only one go. that really re leans reggae. It goes a lot reggae. This is probably my second weakest on the okay. album, if I have to pick one. Um, I've always liked it. Um, Love the bass part in the beginning. There's kind of, it's not a solo, but he the bass line really takes precedence at the beginning. Um, this subtle percussion, and then this epic drum fill into the second part. Um, Love the line, uh, staring faces set in celluloid. Welcome to the late show starring Null and Void. <laughs> it's basically about being a teenager. Okay. Um, and just how, like, the world kind of seems meaningless, and except for that one person that you're into. Um, and I love how long they sit in that same groove in the instrumental break. Normally I'd get bored with that, but it works in this song for me for some reason. Um, and this great echo at the end. Um, and finally, on to track 10, Saving the Best for Last. This is my favorite. Down by the Sea. I forgot how much I had this song um, this one I kind of remembered and uh, it was good getting reacquainted with it Yeah, it's just epic it's actually like about twice the length of every other song on the album yes. but it um, doesn't feel that way at all no, I mean no. I'm like wait a minute they, I thought they thought this was about 7 minutes and then I realized it is. 6 had already gone by and yeah. it was just like but they, they do it's like the opposite of like the last one this one they do a lot more with it. Yeah. Um, love the sparse opening with just this really soft synth pad and some percussion. And then there's a solo that I don't know if it's either it's a guitar or a bass. I can't tell. It sounds like a bass, but there's bass behind it. Um, like I think this captures the reggae, uh, the sound that they were really going for in a much more original way. Interesting. Okay. Um love the melody and all the reverb on the vocal um reese's part is very simple the bass line but it's brilliant such a great groove and the song is really about sex on the beach <laughs> down by the sea i found your hidden treasure just you and me we overdosed on pleasure and then in the in the first chorus sail me down the river till we reach the shore diving to the center eating out the core <laughs> I mean, it's about a beach and, it, you know, having lived near the water all my life and, you know, as I grew up and was walking distance from three beaches, I yeah. love the mood. I get the song, but I mean, it's just, it's, it's largely a pastiche of a port town effectively. Um, but uh, it, it's that those, those lines I quoted are literally about sex on the beach <laughs> and not the drink. Um, right. And then there's this kind of indecipherable vocal in the middle of the line. Uh, the boat that ran adrift is sitting on the sandbar. It's, again, one of those moments where I can't really understand if he's saying a lyric or if it's just making a sound. Um, I think this is probably his best vocal oh, yeah, yeah. on the record. He really has so much passion into his voice when he hits some of those notes. Mm -hmm. um, Especially the one before the sax solo. It's yeah. just gives he you goes, chills before it gets soft he he uh, practically screams yeah and then right. the song just gets quiet 
in the instrumental yeah, break. Just the atmosphere that they they play with throughout the, the song is just wonderful. The dynamics, although how it just stops dead before the line, it's quiet when the tide's low. Um, great sax of uh, solo. Um, love, also love the riff leading to the return of that opening riff. Um, that comes back, but there's this great sax riff that comes in beforehand. Um, and the drumming. This one is the only one that Jerry Spicer gets writing credit on. Um, it's Hay, Stryker, Ham, and Spicer. The dr- the percussion on it is just brilliant. Um, he does this great call and response with the vocal in the last chorus. And I love how he, Colin is just singing along with that guitar or bass in the outro. <laughs> so do you recommend it? Yeah, it's a, an unbalanced album, really. I think the first side is so strong and the second side has its moments but yeah i would i would definitely recommend it i strenuously recommend it again i i just they like i said they were my first favorite band i'm still a big fan and this is this is their masterpiece cargo i re-listened to cargo the other day it's a good solid album but it's just doesn't i haven't quite listened hit the to that in a long one. time yeah my brother owned this on vinyl like back in, i mean so yeah i go it is one of the albums that I have like one of the longest relationships with, because mm-hmm. I mean, there's not much from back then that I've listened to again. Right. Um, and I would recommend checking out Two Hearts, their third album. It's got it's got some really good stuff on it. Um, I'm curious, yeah. Particularly the song "Still Life." It's very chilling, very kind of dark, but but beautiful. Um. Anyway, that's it for business as usual. We're off next week. So until two weeks from now, when we'll be reviewing Blizzard of Oz, doing a bit of heavy metal, 80s metal, um, by Ozzy Osbourne, of course. Always remember, never forget, wherever you go in life, there you are. There you are.